There we go. Right. Welcome everyone to the seventh of our ARG UK autumn seminar series. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about alien amphibians and reptiles in the UK and have a little think about what we can do or indeed whether we do need to do anything. The moderator this evening is Nicola Morris, uh, another of our ARG UK trustees and an expert in uh, non-native species. She works for the Southwest Lakes Trust as Invasive Species Officer. And she has a raft, raft of other credentials, including Project Coordinator for Community Invasive Non-Native Group for the Southwest of England. So she's the perfect person. So I'm gonna hand over to Nicola and she's going to introduce the rest of our expert panel and look after us for the rest of the evening. So over to you, Nicola. Hi, Angie, thanks for that introduction. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to be speaking to you first this evening and giving you a bit of an introduction into the topic and hopefully uh, clear up a few questions which people may have um, already in their minds regarding non-native species and invasive non-native species. Um, and then leading on from that, I'm going to be introducing uh, Chris Newman and um, then Rob Williams and Susie Simpson. And if we get to each of those speakers, I'll introduce them um, in more detail for you. So I hope you enjoy enjoy the uh, the evening and thank you all for joining us. Okay, right, I'm just gonna share my screen with you all. Okay, can everybody see that? Is that is that okay? Brilliant, lovely, thank you. Okay, so uh, the alien species, what can we do about them? Um, it's an interesting question. Um, and so hopefully I'll, I'll be able to pro provide you with some answers um, by the end of the session. So as Angie alluded to, um, I have a number of different hats actually. Um, I'm the trustee for ARG UK and the chair for Cornwall Reptile and Amphibian Group as well. Uh, Invasive Species Officer of the Southwest Lakes Trust. And that's a partnership project with uh, Southwest Water. So I work really closely with the lovely Kate Hills uh, down in the southwest of England. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful project um, working on uh, managing invasive non-native species and also working on biosecurity provision at the reservoirs uh, at Southwest Lakes, uh, at Southwest Water Assets. Um, I'm also the project coordinator for the Community Invasive Non-Native Species Group working at regional level. Uh, I'm chair of the Cornwall Invasive Species Forum and also co-chair the Southwest Invasive Species Forum alongside Kate at Southwest Water. So the original question was alien species and what can we do about them? Um, I thought quite long and hard about this before I started writing my presentation. And uh, for me, one of the biggest questions is what should we actually do about them uh, rather than what we can do about alien species? Um, now, the reason for this question is because of um, the definition of terms. Uh, when I used to lecture on this subject, one of the first introductory lectures that I gave was focusing on definition of terms uh, connected with this subject. Um, all too often we hear um, alien species, alien invasive species used in the wrong context. So I think it's really important that we understand exactly what it is that we're talking about um, before we then go on to talk about any potential management of them. So what are we talking about? Going back to, to basics, uh, most of us will probably say that we know what a native species is, but when I ask people to define that term, some people actually struggle with it quite a bit. And to, to define that, um, that, uh, that, that criteria quite clearly can be tricky. Um, now, the definitions I'm about to give you are not my own. They are the generally accepted definitions of these terms. So um, if anybody wants to bring up on any of those points, then, then please do. And I can pass those on to, to people that have, have come up with the, the definitions. But generally, a native species is one um, which colonised Britain around about 10,000 years ago. Um, this was at the time when the land bridge was flooded. Um, and at that point, any species which were present in uh, Great Britain were considered native and any which weren't present at that time and couldn't get there under their own steam were considered um, non-native species. Um, and because this could be quite a dry subject, I've included some lovely photographs just to, to help the presentation along slightly. So we've got a lovely slow worm there, courtesy of Steve Langham, a nice native reptile. Um, number of native species that we have um, that you'll recognize here, 
some of you live in parts of the country where you're fortunate enough to have most of these species present. Uh, most of you um, who live in Cornwall will, will understand looking at this list that you've got some relatively exotic species there for those of us in Cornwall. We actually only have uh, native to Cornwall common frog, common toad um, and the palmate newt. We do often have records of the others sent in and as a record pool ver validator I always um, try to verify those records with the recorder um, and often they come back as just a misidentified species and people weren't actually aware of what they were looking at. Um, and several uh, reptile species present in the UK as well. Um, so these are um, the native species that, that we, we're often seeing um, and we consider to be native. Um, non-native or alien species, you'll notice I've included the term non-native and alien. Those terms in this instance are interchangeable. Uh, in GB, we tend to use the word non-native. In the rest of Europe, they use the word alien. Um, I've yet to kind of work out the reason for that, but those two terms are, are used interchangeably. The GB non-native species secretariat definition is of a non-native or alien species. It's a subspecies, a species subspecies on a lower taxon introduced by human action outside its natural past or present distribution. So that's what we consider to be a non-native species. Uh, in Great Britain at the moment, we have uh, 3,224 non-native species present. Um, and those that are established um, in the wild, um, we have about 2,000, just over 2,000. Um, though these figures are changing regularly. And I'll come back to those figures in just a moment. Uh, this graph here that the, the actual numbers are, are slightly out of date. I've um, borrowed this courtesy of Non-Native Species Secretariat, um, but the percentages um, won't, won't be too far um, removed. So if you have a look at the, um, the blue lines, these represent the native species within those taxons and the gold bars and the non-native species. So if you have a look at the reptile, the, sorry, the amphibian um, section, um, second from the bottom, you'll realize that 50% of the amphibians, um, we don't have many um, amphibian species in GB anyway, but 50% of those that are present are actually non-native species. So some non-native amphibian species, this list is, is not exhaustive. Um, I'm sure um, most of you can come up with other species which, um, which are also present um, in, in GB. But there's an example of some of those species uh, that, we, that we do have that are non-native. Um, and also some non-native reptile species. Um, and there's another lovely photograph courtesy of Steve Langham, he's a very good photographer, of uh, the Western Green Lizard. So these are species which have been introduced at some point um, over the last 10,000 years. So what's the problem, we might be asking ourselves. Um, non-native species, most of those that are on that list there, you will have seen at some point, I'm sure. Um, so coming back to the data I presented to you before, of those 3,224 non-native species which have been introduced, just over 2,000 are reproducing in the wild, but it's not those we're necessarily concerned about. It's the uh, 193 which are having a um, negative impact on native biodiversity that um, as an invasion biologist I'm most concerned about. Um, and those are made up of 46 freshwater species, 39 marine and 108 terrestrial species. Oh, I've just clicked the wrong button, I do apologise. <laughs> um, so, and the number of those which are established and actually breeding in the wild is almost all of those. So those that are negative tend to be most successful in their reproduction. So we only have six um, which are having a negative impact, but which aren't actually breeding in the wild or reproducing. Um, and these figures are current. Um, they were taken from the JNCC um, UK Biodiversity Index. So it's these that we consider to be invasive, non-native or invasive alien species. So you can see that we do have that, that difference in um, definition between an invasive non-native and a non-native. Uh, now this, uh, it, this graphic here shows quite nicely um, the phases of invasion. So um, you have here the arrival. Uh, they don't tend to get parachuted in. Um, they are um, introduced um, through, through human means and uh, then uh, if they are successful then they will establish um, within those new communities and that new area. Um, if, they can, if they can establish, they will then integrate within that habitat and within those communities, but that isn't even necessarily a problem for, for non-native species. It's when they start to spread and have a detrimental impact that we call them invasive. So it's at that point then that I would start to intervene as an invasion biologist. We're not necessarily concerned with controlling and managing non-native species unless they're having any kind of 
um, negative impact. So the definition of this term is an invasive non-native species, any non-native animal or plant. I also include pathogens and fungi in that, um, in that uh, definition. That has the ability to spread, causing damage to the environment, the economy, our health, and the way we live. So it's an all, it can be an all-encompassing um, term. And the important caveat at the bottom here is that these are species that have been introduced deliberately or accidentally by people. So it isn't always a deliberate in introduction. Sometimes they can be accidentally brought over in shipments or cargo. Um, but it's when they get here and have a detrimental impact in some way that we consider them to be invasive alien or invasive non-native species, and then we would need to do something about it. So the impacts I've mentioned are um, fourfold. So we have economic impacts, and it costs the UK um, taxpayer £1.8 billion every year in damage and control of these species. So if you think of um, a plant like floating pennywort that spreads at 20 centimetres every day, and can fill entire waterways really very rapidly, which then hinders movement um, of, of um, recreational water users, prevents anglers from using that waterway, um, and can, can just um, impact on that habitat and the species living there. Um, environmental um, habitat impacts, I've used an example of a signal crayfish there. They burrow into riverbanks and cause a lot of siltation in that water system. Um, they'll also um, outcompete native species for, for food resources. Um, and also spread crayfish plague to, non to our native white clawed crayfish. So they do have quite a detrimental impact um, in all kinds of ways. Human health is an interesting one. The, the one that springs to mind most readily is a plant giant hogweed, um, a relative of, of our native hogweed, and that causes really nasty burns. If you Google giant hogweed burns, there are some um, very graphic images, some of which I've used on my lectures before, which are very striking and, and a lot of the time you will get hospitalized if you, if you touch the sap from these plants. And then general life as well. So anybody that's tried to buy a property with Japanese knotweed within a few meters of that will struggle to get a mortgage on that property um, because of the, the detrimental impacts that this plant can cause. So in terms of amphibian species, um, I'm sure a lot of you will have some questions about this uh, particular species. The alpine newt is one that I've worked with for many years now. Um, they are stunning animals. They're absolutely beautiful. Um, several several uh, subspecies are native to mainland Europe. Um, they inhabit all kinds of different habitats from um, high altitude, as the name suggests, to, to lowland areas as well. Um, and we have, um, I think there are four subspecies which are known of in the UK. Um, and I've worked with them in Cornwall at a couple of populations for many years in conjunction with the Institute of Zoology and also AFA at various points. Um, so these ones were in a bottle trap. They do live at very high densities um, in their invaded range. The, uh, the largest number of alpine newts that we ever caught in a bottle trap was 14 in one single bottle trap, which was just unbelievable. Um, I, I'm proud to say that we've never lost any newts in a bottle trap, no matter how many had decided to go in there, so we haven't uh, we haven't lost any any alpine newts in that method of catching, even if they've they've been in the bottles in high densities. Now the potential impacts, um, depending on the invaded range, are are disease. They're asympt generally asymptomatic of, of chytrid fungus, um, so it's possible that they could um, carry that disease, as any introduced species um, amphibian species could, if they had that disease when they were in captivity. Um, they will compete with for food resources with native um, amphibian species as well, um, and they do predate on native amphibians. So an example that I use is one of the research ponds I was, I was working at. Um, regularly, every year, 30% coverage of frog spawn, very active wildlife ponds. And uh, two years in a row, I was surveying, the, surveying there um, every week, um, right the way through the year. And we, uh, the second year, we actually only found one uh, common frog tadpole remaining in that pond. Um, and we've seen them um, quite happily um, sucking out the nuclei in, in frog spawn, just chomping away on it. So they have voracious appetites. But why potential? Well, the reason for that is because although they appear to be very invasive in Cornwall, in other parts of the country, I know um, that some of you are listening now have said to me that you don't see a problem with the alpine newt because of the area that you're working in. They really don't seem to have any impact on native species. So we really do need to think about alien or, or non-native species um, in the environment that we're working in and treat that as an individual case 
so it isn't even just regional, it can be from site to site. Uh, I personally think that one of the reasons that we don't, um, that the Alpine need is particularly invasive in, in Cornwall is because of the lack of uh, potential competition. So we don't have great crested newts here. Um, we just have the palmate newts. So that's a possibility that, um, why, of why they could be so successful. So whilst we consider Alpine newts to be an invasive non-native species in Cornwall, it may well be that where you are, they really aren't causing any problems at all. Uh, and a reptile species which um, is commonly reported as, as having um, some detrimental impacts um, is the red eared slider. And I'm not going to talk too much about this because I'm going to let Susie talk about this in more detail later on. Now, this photograph was actually taken by one of my lovely site guardian volunteers um, at Southwest Lakes Trust, <coughs> excuse me, um, at one of our moorland reservoirs, Southwest Waters Mo Moorland Reservoirs. Um, this species um, has been reported commonly at this particular reservoir, but we haven't actually ever got any photographs of it. So this photograph was sent to me um, a couple of months ago and uh, they, it's, it's been reported as having impacts, but those impacts haven't been measured at all. We don't know what those impacts are. We just haven't done the research. So in my opinion at the moment, in this instance, this is just simply a non-native species. We don't know that there are any impacts on that. Um, Interestingly, a couple of days after I had this, we had another report from the same lake and I sent the photographs off to Chris Newman, who we'll be hearing from in a moment. Uh, we couldn't accurately identify the species because of the, um, the, the photograph. Um, these are notoriously different, difficult to photograph when they're in the wild, but we do think it's a different species. So it's possible there have been multiple introductions of different species within that one reservoir. Um, and then in another instance where, um, again in Cornwall, but where I would consider the species to be being invasive, the, um, the turtles had actually they'd taken over a grebe's nest and was using that um, to bask on. And uh, we were getting regular reports from bird watchers and our site guardians about this because the grebes uh, were really struggling and they actually gave up breeding um, on that particular nest and, and they haven't been seen to breed this year. So in, in, in that case, I would consider that potentially there is a problem um, and they are maybe displacing native species. <clears throat> so the same as with the previous slide, we've got potential impacts here, but we really do need to, to look at it on a case by case basis, unless it's a species which widespread does cause a lot of problems. Uh, an international example that I will use here, um, it, it was an intentional introduction actually, one which um, could well have been avoided. So the cane beetle is a native invertebrate species to Australia, and I'm sure this will be very familiar to some of you. Um, but because um, a lot of the land was used for farming, uh, the, the cane beetle did very well and uh, really took to the sugar cane and corn and was damaging that to, the, to such an extent that they had to try to control the cane beetle numbers. So firstly, this is an example of a native invasive species. Um, then they decided to introduce a predator. Now that predator wasn't one which had come from Australia, um, but it was uh, the cane toad introduced in 1935 as a biological control. We've learned a lot from these biological controls um, in the early days. Um, and I work with CABI um, on various other uh, biological control projects, which take decades in some cases to actually get to the stage of release. So they really have learned from the mistakes that other people have made. Um, this, is, this species is native to Central South America. It spreads uh, at a rate of 40 to 60 kilometers every single year um, and has taken over vast areas. There's an interesting, um, quite an amusing Simpsons um, clip, the cartoon Simpsons clip about this actually, which I used to use in my lectures, which demonstrates it quite nicely. Um, but sadly, this species is predating on native um, fauna um, and it's poisonous as well. So they have recorded declines in native predators um, as a result of the introduction of this cane toad. Uh, I just wanted to show you this photograph. So this is a, an olive python um, it, at, uh, at a, um, a, a lake. Um, I'm not suggesting that the cane toads are predating on this at all, um, but it's an example of um, how they're taking advantage of, of uh, local wildlife. What happens here, there's a lot of flooding and the, the dam had, had um, overtopped and all of the cane toad sparrows had become um, submerged. They, they were underwater. So they were coming out of the water at a rate and apparently the whole of the bank was covered in them. Um, and then the photographer noticed that this uh, olive python was, was slithering along the grass. 
um, and these cane toads are actually hitching a ride on its back. So um, it's more of an amusing photograph than anything, but it just shows the, the extent um, you wouldn't normally see them in that number. So what can we do to help? Well, firstly, again, it leads to another question. What is it that we need to prevent? Now, we need to prevent new invasions, invasions of invasive non-native species. Um, I like to take the precautionary approach um, in this instance, so it's a good idea not to introduce uh, non-native species at all if we can help it. Um, but we also need to spread the um, reduce the spread of existing invasive non-native species, so that's plants, animals, and disease as well. Biosecurity is one of the most important things we can do to help prevent the spread of these invasive species. And another definition: it's the exclusion, eradication and effective management of pests and unwanted organisms. I've produced a whole bunch of biosecurity protocols for um, all of our stakeholders at Southwest Water and Southwest Lakes Trust. Um, and the one for biosecurity for field workers is very simple and straightforward. We ask people to check, clean and dry all their equipment before and after they leave the site. Um, and also I'm sure all of you are aware that you should always visit highest risk areas last so that you're preventing helping to prevent the risk um, of any invasive non-native species from spreading. Um, the three-stage hierarchical approach is one that we should all be following. I've put a question mark there, we'll see why in a moment. So the first is prevention. So it's much easier to prevent any problems by um, just not introducing things in the first place, whether or not you think they're invasive or whether they are simply a non-native species. Um, you, you do have to consider um, other factors such as climate change. Um, so some things which are non-native at the moment may, be, may well become invasive non-native later. Um, from there, we um, look at early detection, surveillance monitoring and rapid, rapid response. And then that leads to long-term management and control if it isn't feasible or possible to eradicate that species, if it's a problem. Now, the question mark relates to number four, which I think we should be including in this um, four-stage hierarchical approach, which is to build awareness and understanding. So if we can understand what the potential for problems could be, then we may be less likely to introduce things in the first place. Then if we have them introduced, then we need to understand what it is that we can do, whether it's feasible and even whether it's necessary. Um, and just one final point here to mention is trends. Um, so this, this is true of, of anything. Um, if you look at something like a, a, um, a dog show, for example, whichever dog breed wins Croft, in the, the, the 12 months after that, people want a puppy of that sort. And exactly the same thing is true for um, non-native species of all sorts, uh, particularly with reptiles. So the example I'm gonna use here is the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and uh, my colleagues at RSPCA that I've worked with for many years will, will testify to this, that as soon as there's a new series or film that's been launched with these um, <laughs> attractive little things on them, then people want them as a pet. They want to have these animals, not realizing um, that they're not necessarily that easy to look after. Um, and after that, then a lot of people sadly have to rehome their animals, or we get a lot more reports of them being dumped into the wild. Um, so that's just something to think on. So I hope that's made uh, the situation a little bit clearer. Personally, as an invasion biologist, I'm working with invasive non-native species. Um, the, the title of the, the seminar is, is Alien Species. Um, or non-native species, um, but we must make sure that we're using those terms independently of each other so that we're very clear about what it is that we're talking about, and it's the invasive alien species which are causing the problem. So thank you very much for listening. Um, if you have any questions, um, then uh, please put them into the Q&A, um, and then we'll go through those um, at the end, um, and then we'll open up the panel discussion so that we can all um, a look at that. I should have mentioned that at the beginning, actually. I'll have a look and see um, through the chat as well and see if we can get to some of those questions, but feel free to put the questions in the chat. Okay, um, right, I'm going to hand over now to um, Chris Newman. Um, I asked each of our um, guest speakers for a little bio so that I could just um, describe what it is um, that, that they, they do. Um, now, um, I take no responsibility for what's been handed to me, so um, please don't shoot me down for what's been put there. So, so Chris Newman has actually um, said that he should be introduced um, as the village idiot. So I would argue that point, um, but um, he, has, um, he has a number of hats as most of us do. So um, his day job is chief, as chief executive of the Reptile and Exotic Trade, Trade, Pet Trade Association. 
Um, he works with government on legislative issues um, in terms of trade, conservation societies and welfare. He's a trustee of the, um, the pet charity and his informal day job is over, oversight of the National Centre for Reptile Welfare, which is a, a welfare rehoming and research facility at Hadlow College in Kent. Um, he's former chair of the Federation of British Herpetologists. Um, he's been a keeper for 56 years um, and as the BHS council member. Um, oh no, that's sorry, that's the next bit on from there. Sorry, Susie, I was <laughs> introducing you already. Um, he's been a, a keeper for 56 years and he's put, in other words, the village idiot. <laughs> Great, Chris, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. I, yeah, I really think that's the best description. It's the one I always actually use. Uh, yeah, good evening and thank you for letting me be here. Um, technology is also not my thing, so this could also go horribly wrong. We practiced it once, but that went okay, but uh, we shall see. Um, I'll be very brief in my presentation and really, uh, so I've been involved with non-native species for quite a long time as a supporter of keeping with exotic species that can be seen as a bit of a conflict of interest. Um, my argument uh, in many ways is the pet trade has been part of the problem and therefore actually we should be part of the solution. And that's really how the National Centre for Reptile Welfare came about. Um, like all things, it was all good things that happened. It was a, a conversation in a pub. It was a, quite a surreal situation. Um, I met the principal of the college um, and we talked about things and I talked about what I wanted to do and he said, well, we have a spare building and that was how it started. Um, I actually live in Southampton and the centre is based in Tunbridge in Kent, so it was not entirely logical place to build it. What I wanted to do was, I'm very much driven by evidence and so much of what we look at is based on opinion and what I want to do is actually try to get to the facts. Uh, across the board. So what we do here at, this, uh, at the centre is we take in reptiles and amphibians from across the country for rehoming. And what I wanted to look at and try and understand is why are these animals being rehomed? Uh, is the industry doing things wrong? Are we selling the wrong animals? What, what are the actual issues? So we define between a rescue and a rehome. If the owner of the animal contacts us to take the animal in, we regard that as a rehome. If that contact comes from a third party, we define that as a rescue. So in this context, we deal with a growing number of rescues of non-native species of reptiles and amphibians that have been found in wild. Um, let me try and share the screen and this will probably go horribly wrong. Ooh. A miracle, okay. So the centre is a joint venture between the pet charity, of which I'm a trustee, and Hadlow College, and it is supported by the Reptile and Exotic Pet Trade Association in terms of funding, as well as the um, Federation of British Herpetologists. Uh, the centre opened in August 2018. If we look at the top left, so in 2018, we took in 296 animals, 22 rescues, 274 rehomes. 2019, 755, and you can see that there's a massive jump this year to, um, so far we're on 1,012. 239 of those are rescues, 773 are, re are rehomes. Um, it's very difficult to put context to that. We don't really, we've started, we don't really publicize or advertise. It's all through organic growth, through word of mouth. So I don't think we can read anything particular into those figures. Um, it's, it will be interesting to see how it goes. If we look down here in terms of rescues, what we define as a rescue. So we've had 239 in so far this year. Of these, 144 were found in the wild. So um, of these, about 80% will be turtles. Um, if we, so if we look over here, I don't know if I can move that down out of the way. Yeah. So um, we've had 50, since we've opened, we've had 51 different species and subspecies of turtles. Um, this year, we've had a record number, 326. 
but of those 182 are slider turtles. Now, we, we, there are three separate subspecies of Trachemi scripta, scripta, scripta elegans, and scripta tussii. We can't count those all as uh, sliders. So that is actually the number one species that comes into our center. And we literally take those from across the UK. You can also see that musk turtles figure quite high on here, 83. Those are also not so commonly found in wild. Uh, we, we see very few of those found in wild. And that's probably because it's much more of an aquatic species that actually sits on the bottom. I, I, I think we don't understand the, the distribution of turtles and that's something Susie will talk about. So what we can do is we take them in and we rehome them. Um, there has been a big issue with slider turtles and a new piece of legislation came in from the EU a couple of years ago uh, in terms of invasive species regulations, which prohibited not just the sale, but the keeping of slider turtles. And the problem that has created is it's now very difficult for people to rehome them. People often think that most of these animals are neglected and abused and people simply don't want them. In our experience is that is absolutely not the case. Uh, people just are just as attached to these animals as they would be dogs or cats. Their circumstances change, they need to rehome those animals. Now, because it's very difficult, most of this is about euthanasia. So if you take them into most places, they will just euthanize them. People won't do that. So I think we're seeing increased numbers now because people are desperate. They can't rehome the animal. Their circumstances have changed. So they can no longer keep it. They're not prepared to have it put down. So they will simply uh, release it. The other, um, in, we also look at stowaways. So stowaways, I've been involved in the whole thing of uh, non-native species coming in with fresh produce for about 25 years now. Uh, predominantly, I've been working on invertebrates, not vertebrates. But part of the work we do here is taking animals in. We've seen a big number of animals coming in from India this year. We've had from Bengal monitors, which are ex extremely large lizards, three feet long and critically endangered, deadly saw scale vipers, little frogs, little lizards, all sorts of things. In terms of, so stowaways will be a category that have come in uh, accidentally. And some of this will be people bringing them back accidentally in their suitcases, geckos and things like that. We had an interesting case in last month where we saw over 30 Italian wall lizards coming in with shipments of grapes. One of the things we do at the centre, um, because we're in, we can cover the whole of the country, we have about 100 drop-off points. So although we're based in Kent, uh, we've taken animals from Penzance up to um, Inverness. Um, we, tr we try to encourage people to hand them in. The other service we offer, which is developed over the last couple of years, is I get a lot of people reporting we found a snake. Uh, so corn snakes will be the second most common species we see. People find non-native snakes in the garden. We have an emergency number, they can ring us. We will put a, a notice out for that and we'll arrange for somebody to go and collect that animal and then arrange for it to be transported back to us. Um, that's been a very successful project we've done. Our record response time at the moment stands at six minutes from receiving the call to actually getting somebody on their way. Uh, the average response time is somewhere between 30 minutes and 45 minutes. And I think the longest it's taken so far is about three hours. Um, that's basically just an oversight of what it is that we do here. Um, and obviously, I'll be happy to ask, answer any questions later on in the program. I won't take up any more of your time. Thank you. Thank you for that, Chris. That's really interesting. I think for a lot of people that are unfortunately having to rehome animals, it's, it's reassuring to know there is somewhere that, that they can take them. Um, it, it does help prevent a lot of uh, animals from being released illegally, um, but also it's just that peace of mind. As you say, a lot of people aren't uh, just dumping animals. They just genuinely can't keep them. So, yeah, it's, it, it's a wonderful thing that you're doing there. Thank you. Um, OK, so now we've got um, Rob Williams. Um, so he's going to be um, talking to you about um, the research that he's been um, doing. Um, he uh, has a background in endangered reptile conservation and invasion ecology. So he works in very similar areas to me. Um, he's previously worked in partnership with FFI, Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust and local NGOs on overseas projects um, and uh, all sorts of species that he's been working with there. Um, and also in the management of the invasive green iguana. 
So previous research has focused on ecological behavioural interactions between native and non-native lizards. Um, and also he gained his PhD from the University of Leeds uh, last year um, in, on his research into the invasion and ecology of the common wall lizard in the UK and also in Vancouver Island in British Columbia. Um, so thank you, Rob. Thank you, Nicola. Good evening to everybody. All right, I'd just like to start with a, a very brief overview of the, uh, the whole research project into the, uh, the invasion ecology of common wall lizard, uh, Padarchis muralis. For those of you who may not be uh, familiar with this, this situation, uh, the Padarchis uh, muralis and uh, Sicula have been expanding and continue to expand their uh, non-native range across much of uh, continental Europe and even over into uh, North America. Uh, in the UK, we now have numerous very well-established populations of uh, muralis, primarily in the south of England. And they've been here for a, a good number of years now, but uh, really any evidence of any uh, ecological impact has been purely uh, anecdotal. So uh, the purpose of my uh, research is really to try and get an insight in some of the, uh, the invasion potential of the species. And uh, that was very much a multidisciplinary approach to, uh, to gaining this insight. So I looked at uh, population and individual fitness. It's just uh, uh, a bit of uh, spatial ecology in terms of what was limiting uh, uh, range expansion and patterns of dispersal across the landscape. Uh, I looked at uh, a bit of functional ecology in comparison of bite performance and morphology between muralis and our native lizards. A uh, bit of behavioural ecology in terms of scent recognition, again between native lizards and uh, the invading wall lizard. And then uh, what I'm going to focus on with this talk is uh, stakeholder discourse and opinion towards the lizards, so a bit of uh, social science. Okay, so this was a, a piece of work that was published last year in uh, in People and Nature. And it kind of evolved over the course of uh, the rest of the research when I was out uh, in the field for three years, obviously over the, the field season, catching a hell of a lot of lizards, taking various data from them. There was a, an incredible amount of uh, engagement with various stakeholder groups from general public, landowners, land managers, conservation workers. And it, it soon became clear that there was a, a huge array of uh, different sentiment and discourse with regards to the lizards being here. And not only have we got a huge range of opinion, you know, opposite ends of the spectrum from people very much in favour of the lizards and uh, very much against the lizards, there's also some very emotive sentiments, which hint at something a, a little bit deeper going on in terms of our relationship with non-native species and that, that sentiment there possibly typifies that. You know, somebody, somebody mentioned that it's like being on holiday with the wall lizards here. So this was really formed the basis of uh, the study. So the study is a, it's a discourse analysis. Uh, what we've got is we've got an introduced species in the common wall lizard with which yeah, we've got high levels of human interaction. Some of these uh, well-known populations are on very urban, very busy populated areas, particularly on the Bournemouth coast. So we've got high levels of human interaction, but uh, relatively low levels of knowledge regarding any impacts or even the origins of the lizards. A lot, a lot of people don't know that they're non-native. So this situation, it presents a really interesting case study to investigate, as I say, our relationship with non-natives and our perceptions towards them. So to add a bit of a context to the study, I explored the ways in which different stakeholder groups, so the public, land managers, etc., might share in their, their views and their, their opinion towards the lizards being here, and then delve a little bit deeper and figure out you know, the reasoning behind some of these opinions, how they may have come about. So that the research question is then, how and why do individual groups, individuals differ in their opinions towards the lizard introduction? And what does this discourse tell us about, uh, about perceptions and attitudes towards introduced species and, and their management in general? 
So I won't go too much into the methodology of, of Q, but it's it's basically got its uh, roots in the clinical sciences and psychology. And uh, it combines a qualitative and semi-quantitative analysis of subjectivity amongst uh, individuals. It's been used a lot in, in terms of assessing uh, patients' perceptions of care that they receive in hospitals and, and things like that. But it is starting to get used in the environmental sciences a bit more now. So in terms of the qualitative aspect, individuals offer their subjective opinion by rank sorting a number of statements regarding the topic, in this case, the presence of the war lizards, and they rank them in based on their own experience. Um, what we then do is we take a statistical approach to correlate participants' uh, response. And what we see, we look for patterns then about how participants are grouping in terms of the viewpoints that they share and on what we get then is typically you get around two to four main themes or opinions that emerge that are very distinct from each other and then we could start looking at how how and why people fit within each group or each factor the beauty of this method though compared to uh, you know more traditional survey methods is you need a, a relatively small sample you don't need to uh, involve too many people to get these two to four overarching opinions. Okay, so this is just an illustration of what participants uh, were faced with, a series of statements which they ranked, as I said, in terms of their own experience on a scale of minus six to six, obviously uh, you know, statements that they uh, couldn't identify with or didn't agree with, and then the opposite end of the spectrum there to strongly agree with. But I won't spend too much time on, on that. So following the analysis then, it uh, became clear that there were three overarching uh, themes or conversations that were going on regarding the lizards. And I've uh, conceptualized them with their own title. So the first one was I termed innocent until proven guilty. A second was uh, a precautionary informed concern opinion. And thirdly, uh, more the merrier. And what I'll do now is I'll just uh, take a bit of time to, uh, to explain the defining features of each of these overarching themes. So the innocent until proven guilty then. So this, this viewpoint identifies a lack of personal knowledge amongst the people who have this viewpoint. And, and they stress the need for uh, further evidence, solid evidence of specific impacts of the war lizards in order to form their opinion either way. But generally, in principle, they figure that the introduction and the presence of the lizards is not not a good thing. And this is this is probably based on some existing a broad theoretical knowledge of non-native species alien species, whatever terminology makes sense to them. Uh, interestingly, and this is the point for discussion, hopefully, uh, people with this viewpoint, uh, they didn't consider the, uh, the origins of the species itself as being particularly important in terms of making their judgment of whether they should be here or not. What they were more interested in was the ecological impacts. So this, this kind of goes against you know, the, the common notion that all non-natives are bad. We're starting to see a hint there that you know there's another discussion going on here. Um, now this viewpoint does does acknowledge that there is a value to the presence of the war lizards <clears throat> in terms of the opportunity that they they provide to engage with wildlife, but generally speaking, they're not inclined to support any kind of theoretical management should that be at all practical, unless they have you know strong evidence to. to claim that they are having a negative impact. So, uh, yep, the second theme then, precautionary informed concern. So uh, the people sharing this view, they were very definite that the, there is an ecological threat posed by the lizards. And that's that's not entirely based on any scientific evidence. Like I said, we don't, we don't really have any, certainly up until the point of this research. But nonetheless, they were, they consider there is a there is a threat there. Um, 
proponents, they, they see no place for the war lizard within our, our wildlife. They're very, very certain on that, particularly if that's at the expense of, of native lizards. So if, if uh, native lizards are getting pushed out, then that's a definite no-no. Uh, um, and it's likely that this opinion is based on you know, substantial existing subject knowledge about the specific specific risks that, that the lizards may may uh, pose and uh, a deeper theoretical knowledge about the invasion process in general and maybe even first-hand experience of you know interactions between native lizards and war lizards in the wild again there's a shared view here that the war lizards do hold a, a novelty value and that their conspicuousness compared to native lizards actually provides an opportunity for for education and engagement but conversely, you know, they, uh, they do consider that management uh, is an option, you know, if, uh, if practical. And then the final viewpoint here, the more the merrier. So this is uh, the complete reverse of the other two, two themes. Here the, the wall lizards are enthusiastically welcomed and I've highlighted here some important points that I feel and we can discuss them later. Um, but not only are they, are they welcome, there's actually a strong desire for the, the lizards to thrive here. Interestingly, there's a, there's a certainty about the wall lizards being completely harmless and there being no threat to native fauna and that there is no knowledge gap regarding the, the impacts. And these, these positive sentiments, they, they seem to result from people who have a local colony of wall lizards or people who interact with the lizards fairly regularly not necessarily go out to seek interaction with the lizards, but they're just there in a local area. And this has provided opportunities to become familiar with the lizards and their behavior and, and uh, just getting used to seeing them around. So this familiarity, and this is, this is an interesting point I feel, this familiarity is born uh, from frequent observation. This has shaped uh, a very unique view of ownership and sentimental attachment to the war lizards. To the point where they're almost considered as pets, not pests, pets. <laughs> so this is a, this is a very interesting point in terms of uh, pathways to future spread. Um, and as you can imagine, there's a very definitive protectionist attitude towards interference and outside interest with the lizards, and a, very much a hands-off approach. So as you can imagine there's absolutely no support there for any kind of uh, control or management of them. And interestingly, these people who hold this view, they kind of reach out and identify several conditions that justify the presence of wallers being here and that they have a right to be here. So uh, you hear sentiments such as, well, if they made it here, then they've got a right to be here or, well, climate change, isn't it? So yes, they've got every right to be here. It's warming up, so it's suitable for them. All very valid points. So let's take a little a deeper view about how and why individuals might group in their opinion. And this is a bit more theoretical. Uh, so we've seen that there's four areas of disagreement there. There's disagreement in the acceptance of the wall as being here. There's disagreement in terms of the level of concern about the threat that they pose, uh, attitudes towards non-natives in general, and difference in opinion towards the, whether they should be managed or controlled in any way. So, so what, how can we can explain that difference between the groups? And, and theory tells us that, that comes down to different levels of knowledge and uncertainty amongst individuals. So what happens is theoretically, when, when you're faced with limited information about a given subject, you then reach out as a kind of mental uh, shortcut to other areas of influence to make your judgment. This is the term heuristics there. People aren't familiar with that term. Um, so you open yourself up, when you have limited knowledge, you open yourself up to other subjective areas of influence. And we'll take a, a little look at what those might be in this case. So the major drivers of opinion. So here we have the, the innocent until proven guilty group. So here we see they've got their, their, a bit of theoretical knowledge about non-native species in general. Uh, they've got uncertainty about the specific impacts that might be posed, and that gives them a perception of risk, not a knowledge of what the risk might be, but a perception of risk. And uh, 
they've also identified that there are some benefits there to having the lizards here, as I've mentioned. And secondly, then the precautionary view. So I have a shared theoretical knowledge about non-natives. And again, they acknowledge there are benefits, but where they differ is they have this very direct experience or specific knowledge of the non-native species impacts and the invasion process in general. And then finally, the more the merrier, we can see where the different drivers, the different domains of influence come from. It's purely on the positives. So the benefits of the blizzards here, the experiences that they have by having the lizards in the garden, watching the behavior and the familiarity that they have. And like I said, that uh, kind of ownership that they, they take on board through that familiarity with the, the lizards. Okay, so if you look at these, why, why there's these similarities between the, the precautionary group and the innocent until proven guilty group, just a little delve a bit further. So the similarities are probably not, not too uh, surprising really, considering 84% of the, the people who had these views come from an environmental science background and are likely to be familiar to varying degrees with the, the various concepts and terminology regarding non-native species that uh, Nicola pointed out earlier. Um, and as a rule, as a result, both of these views, they express some element of the precautionary approach to non-native species that kind of permeates, you know, some of the uh, the professions that these people are in. So that's that ends at some kind of level of education there about non-natives and invasives that's, that's driving that opinion. So where do the differences come in? How do they come about? Well, it's down to uh, uncertainty, uncertainty of the impacts, as we saw in the last slide there. The innocent until proven guilty, they have a greater deal of uncertainty about the, the impacts and therefore they're reaching out to more, more emotive influences. And as I mentioned, that seems to be this positive interaction that they can see, a positive influence that the lizards have. And that translates as positive feelings garnered from opportunities for engagement, translating to a lower perceived risk. On the flip side, the precautionary approach, you know, we're suggesting that they may have more direct experience or knowledge about what the, the impacts of non-natives, particularly non-native reptiles might be. And so for less uncertainty and therefore more concern about uh, the impacts and result in this more hard line precautionary approach. So the big question is, why does the more the merrier viewpoint diverge so differently from those other two views? Well, this is purely because they come from a completely different domain of, of influence in terms of their opinion. So they're much more less likely to have any empirical or specialist knowledge of non-natives, invasive non-natives and the whole invasion process. So their viewpoint is purely based on this positive effect heuristic and that's created this parochial knowledge, or perceived knowledge. Like I mentioned earlier, they, they don't see any, or they claim to have knowledge that they're having absolutely no effect on uh, native fauna. And quite worryingly, worrying actually, there appears to be a very limited engagement with scientific evidence to form this view. And it's, as I said, it's purely derived on the positive personal experiences. So we're typically looking at people who might have you know, members of the public who have the lizards in the garden, or as I said, they encounter them fairly regularly. So this is very much a, a lay person perspective and it, uh, I'm going to get a bit uh, philosophical here. This is, um, it's hints at a, a more deeper reflection of uh, variation between how people actually perceive nature and balance in nature and people's overall relationship with nature. Um, so, so what we're thinking is, you know, you've got um, people who place a functionality on uh, nature. So people who take the animals that they see on a daily basis, in this case, the lizards, they kind of regard them on face value. They know they're there, they engage with them, they watch them, but it, it goes no further than that. So they, they see, <coughs> excuse me, they see nature is very functional. And then the opposite of that is you have people who... Uh, might highly value the authenticity of nature as subjective as as that may be and and those people are probably the people who have had an education in uh, biological sciences and environmental sciences and uh, 
So it's hinting at a lot more going on perhaps than we initially think when we, we talk about people's views of non-natives. It, it goes a lot deeper than we may think. So just some final conclusions then and points hopefully for discussion. We've, uh, we've seen that this is a significant variation between stakeholder groups regarding the presence and management of the lizards and non-natives in particular. And this, this kind of flags early signs that these opposing views might cause some uh, complications when it comes to management, not just of the lizards, but any uh, charismatic or, or well-liked invasive non-native species that uh, we may uh, be up against. And this is a particularly important point, like I, I mentioned before, the strong positive sentiment towards the lizards from a subset of the public um, and this possessive view, um, in my opinion, that's that could lead, particularly in the case of the war lizards, where the introduction is secondary. People people moving the lizards about from populations that are already here, not necessarily individuals that are, are coming in as stowaways, but secondary movement from existing populations. And this this um, viewpoint here lends itself to, I think, the uh, the spread of non-native species. So this possessive view about perhaps wanting them in the garden. Um, and wanting them locally. So, yeah, and the discourse analysis it illustrates that the awareness and the wider concept of non natives and invasion ecology as a whole is, is lacking, particularly amongst the general public. And uh, it even suggests that scientific evidence alone may not even be enough to sway uh, certain people in their view of uh, non natives. And in this regard, it might be worth considering that engagement with a characterful, conspicuous non-native like uh, war lizards may actually provide a useful tool to addressing this and address, addressing some of the subjectivity that is uh, influencing people's opinions. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, finally, the discourse highlights that a softer view of non-native species does exist even amongst uh, env environmental professionals that, um, the um, there isn't a, there is a bias towards non-natives. Uh, this whole dichotomy of native species good, non-natives bad. This this particular case study highlights that that isn't actually the case, and it's it's held within certain individuals that there is a softer approach to non-natives, and that maybe we should uh, really start considering uh, reappraising how we classify what is a danger and, and what isn't. Okay, thank you. That's uh, from me. Thank you very much for, for that, Rob. It just highlights really um, the complex subject that we're talking about. It's not just the terminology um, which needs clarification. Um, it's not just further research that we need to do, but it's also public perceptions which um, clearly um, are, they're so varied and for all sorts of reasons. So it really is a very complex subject. Um, yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, and now our final speaker um, is Susie Simpson. Um, Susie, um, she is a BHS council member and uh, the Natterjack newsletter editor. Uh, she's also a lecturer at Hadlow College um, and she's studying uh, as well as that for her MRes um, at the University of Kent, um, researching released and captive pet turtles in the UK. She's the project lead for the Turtle Valley project, um, which, which you're gonna hear about. Um, and she also has previous experience, including working with Durrell reptile translocation teams in Mauritius and several years assisting PhD research in Canadian freshwater turtles um, at the University of Toronto. Um, so I'll hand over to you now, Susie. Thank you, Nicola, that's great. Right, my turn to share screen. So, as I say, um, I'm doing research um, as part of a master's out of the um, University of Kent. So um, hello to everyone. Lovely to talk to you about um, turtles and the turtle tally. So just to get started about turtles, we don't actually have any native freshwater terrapins in the UK. There have been fossils found um, that show us that European pond turtles were here around about 9,000 years ago. Um, and uh, they, there is some consideration that remnant populations do still exist. So um, in Europe, it's a different case. In Europe, we actually do have native species of um, terrapins. Um, so Portugal, Spain, Italy, and Greece 
um, good examples of where there's research being done with regards to released pet turtles out there and actually how they're thriving, they're breeding, um, and they're out competing native species, native terrapin species. So um, the thing with uh, something like the trichemist species, so our red eared sliders, our yellow bellies, and our cumberlands, we actually find that they grow a lot larger, they have higher fecundity. Um, and they're just a lot more successful in outcompeting those species for resources, things like food and basking spaces. So, and this all affects how well they thrive because obviously um, those kind of factors really are important. You know, basking for heat is, and metabolizing food and things like that are all very relevant with regards to how well a reptile does. So this all links in um, to pet, pet trade links. Um, uh, Terrapins, um, you, when they're really, really small, uh, when they're really young, they're extremely um, cute and they're very easy to keep because obviously um, people used to buy them when they were really small, about the size of 50 pps, and they were very cheap to buy. So kids could get one of these tiny little terrapins and they could pop them in a pot of water and they were able to keep them quite easily. Now the issue rises when these animals actually get a lot bigger and they're very long lived species, 60 plus years. So we're talking about animals that will get a lot bigger and um, housing those animals um, later down the years uh, can be a lot more difficult. And so um, just uh, uh, as an estimation, they say that 23 million red-eared sliders were actually exported out of the US, um, mm -hmm. not to the, just to the UK, but exported out of the US between 1998 and 2002 which is a huge number of terrapins to be leaving the country. And these were both wild and um, farmed red-eared sliders. So then we come to um, uh, sort of legislation. And um, one of the legislations that Chris talked about earlier was the EU Invasive Non-Native Species Regulations. And this was mandated in 20, 2015, came into force in 2016. And as of uh, the 1st of January 2021, it will continue to be what they call retained EU law. So it will stay. Now, with that come stipulations, like Chris said, um, you can't sell them, exchange them, import these animals, export, breed or keep them. And there's a, a long list of these animals. Now on there is the trichemist species and the subspecies. So we have the red deer uh, slider, the yellow belly slider and the cumberland. And uh, these animals come under these stipulations. Now, the issue arises in the fact that these animals, um, there are difficulties not only for general public sort of navigating legislation and what it says, but additionally, where those animals go if they're not going to stay with that person. So when these animals get too big to keep or circumstances change because 60 years might be a long time and something, some stuff changes during that time. Um, we find ourselves in a position where we might need to rehome or move that animal on. And this has been the difficulty for people. Um, rehoming, it stipulates that you have provision of evidence of ownership pre-listing. And so that means you would need to have vet records, microchipping, pet insurance. And although with our domestic species, something like a dog, you know, we have to have them microchipped and all these other things. And we usually have pet insurance and we go to the vets every year and all of these kind of things that may not necessarily be um, the kind of um, evidence you have with regards to um, keeping a turtle that you've had for like the last 20 years. So um, this comes down to needing to move on the animal. We, you have to take it to a licensed sanctuary. And actually within the last couple of years, um, we've only just had the NCRW and the um, National Turtle Sanctuary um, offering a place in order for these animals to go to, and they have licenses. Um, and there are some smaller uh, places that do, private places that do have licenses too. So it is illegal to release non-natives. And unfortunately we do get um, people having the issue of, well, do I go jump through the hoops to be able to do this or navigate the legislation and maybe get in trouble? Or do I just go and walk down to the local pond and put it out there? And this is what we think might, might be happening. And especially with regards to our current situations, people might be struggling and actually going and do that might be the easiest thing. So potential impacts and nobody panic. This is a, a common snapping turtle. Um, this is a photo taken in um, Canada. So this is not in the UK, um, but this turtle is popping out ping pong ball size um, eggs. So 
here in the UK, we don't actually have much evidence of the impacts of terrapins. Um, and as Nicola was explaining, actually invasive, then being classed as invasive on the IAS regs, we actually don't have much to say that they are invasive here in the UK. There isn't enough evidence really to categorize like that. Um, we can think about the potential impacts, things like climatic changes. If you look at the Met Office um, stats and look at all of the temperatures and things, we have been having uh, longer, hotter summers. And actually with regards to terrapins uh, hatching out eggs, you know, this will become relevant for them. Um, People have, we have heard of people saying that they've seen eggs, terrapin eggs, um, whether they've actually um, lasted or hatched out or all of those kind of questions we might have about it is another thing. We don't have any evidence of it. Um, so additionally, uh, there's no lack, there's a lack of predators here to manage the numbers. So if they did continue to thrive rather than just survive, um, there's not really, um, you know, we might have foxes and birds that might eat the hatchlings, but otherwise there's nothing really that's going to um, predate on them. And we have um, disease tra transmission as well. So nematodes, you know, parasitology diseases. Um, and we've also got competition to consider with other species. So although we don't have native species, uh, terrapin species here, we do have um, other species and like Nicola said again the grebe nest as an example um, when she told us about it is something that we are considering that they may take up those basking spots in order to get some heat and warm up. So briefly the Turtle Tally UK project started um, and was developed in 2018. We launched it in 2019. Um, it runs all year round and it's basically looking at mapping the distribution of release pet turtles in the UK. Um, it, the main aims are just educating, raising awareness um, and contributing to current data sets. And we're collaborating with Hadlow College National Centre for Reptile Welfare and the British Herpetological Society. But the great thing is that more people are getting on board to help us, which is fantastic. Arg UK have um, provided us data this year, which has been amazing to look at. And um, we've also been working with Angling Trust and Canals and Rivers Trust. So um, Robert was talking about opinions and this links in because actually um, pre doing any of this when I was researching turtles in Canada actually you know we heard these kind of things like they eat the ducklings in our pond, I've seen them grab a leg um, or they affect the habitat, they eat all the fish, you know the anglers get quite cross about it and say oh they're, they're always eating our fish. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because adult turtles, terrapins, you look at trichemist species, you know, they're, when they're young, they'll be more carnivorous. And when they're older and when they're adults, they're more herbivorous. Um, snapping turtles might be a whole nother ball game, though. Um, the things that we found when we actually talked to people about the tally, we've actually found that people are quite emotive. Like Robert said, they're quite attached and there's some sentiment there. You know, I love my turtle in the local pond. It's been there since 2009. Or, um, you know, if I tell you where they are, you'll remove them and euthanize them. And so these are come a couple of the things that we've come across with regards to dealing in, with the citizen science research. So when we started out, we looked at just some figures before we got started and the NBN Atlas gave us 582 records from 1990 to 2019. And this is purely sightings for redhead sliders around the country. Um, it doesn't actually include any other species of terrapins. So you can imagine this is quite a lot to be cited, um, but snapping turtles and other turtles weren't actually included in that. So if we look at our pilot um, study, so in our first year, we actually had 14 records, six different species of turtle, eight different counties, and most sightings were between 11 and two. Now, um, obviously they come out to bask during that period because the sun's up and they warm themselves up ready to get going. And so these kind of times fit in with what they would kind of do. And new records suggest similar spatial distribution to existing MBN data sets. So we've got this cluster happening around London and up near Liverpool, Manchester. And then if we look at our um, results this year from the Turtle Valley alone, it was 35 sightings. So we were up on our sightings previously. And so obviously a bit more awareness of the project. Um, they varied in range. So we were moving a bit out 
a bit uh, further out and our we still had the spatial distribution similarity. So we had London uh, sort of clusters and we also had the ones further up north. Now, um, we mainly had 45% uh, percent were yellow-bellied sliders. We also had 25% red-eared sliders and the Cumberland sliders and the uh, cooters, mac turtles and soft shell sightings were on the lower numbers, but they were actually on there. We didn't get any snapping turtles this year, but um, and we didn't get musk turtles, but like Chris said, they're bottom walkers, so they wouldn't tend to be seen. They just look like a pebble. So even for myself, searching for them on purpose um, was very difficult to find them. So with the ARG data, we actually got, uh, in total, we got 173 sightings. Now these sightings did include some from earlier years. So from 2006, we had a couple of sightings. Um, so we plotted them all out to have a look at where we were seeing them. And our furthest was up near Dundee um, and, and furthest down south um, in the west was uh, near Falmouth. And 54.8% of these sightings were trichemist species. 5.7 were European pond turtles and 39% are what considered other terrapins. So this is the other category that I have on their record ball. Um, there were three soft shell turtle sightings out of that and they've got quite a distinct shape. Now the citizen science does bring up a few things and that is reliability and misidentification and this is something we have to consider. But as you can see up here we have identification keys from the Langton papers. We have um, several of these pictures that we use in order for people to identify um, what they've seen. We also ask for photo evidence and actually with ARG there are a lot of volunteers who are already experienced in a lot of HERP um, research so they're able to provide um, uh, you know sort of um, viable um, sightings. So if we look at our percentages, we actually have a very large number of single uh, individuals in a sighting, which is uh, some experts would say great because actually um, these experts would say that what they think is if it's a singular turtle in a pond, it's not going to cause much damage. If there's uh, multiples, then it's going to be an issue. Um, and if we take a look here, we've got nearly 70, pretty much 70 percent are, are single turtle sightings. So. Um, we do have some twos, threes, fours and fives, but we are on the lower end of the scale. And this might be down to maybe one person saw one terrapin and the other person saw the same terrapin. But either way, if we're not seeing multiples, then um, we're hoping that there's not too many in those locations. So just to have uh, show you a couple of maps just from what I've been looking at. Um, this one uh, is a, a Welsh turtle out in Wales. Uh, in uh, a river and lake, you know, but in a river, and basically, this animal is out there in the middle of nowhere, obviously, um, poodling around in these water bodies, and um, obviously has free run of whatever they like. So, if they've got fish or whatever they're, they're, they're eating, which we don't know yet, hopefully, we'll find out. Um, and so, they're able to move around, they can go down these streams, um, and so obviously, they've got free reign there. But if we look at this turtle, this turtle sitting in this pond, um, there's two ponds next to, him, uh, to each other. They don't have any rivers or anything um, linking to it. So there's no other water, major water bodies that we can see around them. And they're totally surrounded uh, by housing. So this is probably the scenario we might see um, a terrapin getting a phone call at the reptile center saying, we found a terrapin, uh, it was walking down the road. And the chances are it, it might have been one of these animals that thought I need to move somewhere else or go somewhere else uh, because the habitat or food resource or whatever it is, isn't suitable. And so they moved on and were found. So what questions are posed? So what are the solutions for this kind of thing? And, you know, prevention or cure. So at the moment, bans um, have been put in place and stopping um, animals being, from being moved around. I mean, um, if we look at cooters, they're quite a large species um, and, and yet they're not banned. Uh, this, and yet we have trichemists that are, are uh, not allowed. And um, looking at sort of what do we do with the turtles in the end if they are actually causing an impact? Is euthanasia the option? Um, is rehoming the option? Do we actually have enough space or funding to provide enough um, facilities for rehoming? Because I know uh, from a lot of the general public, they wouldn't want to see these animals euthanized. That's the reason they don't want to provide data. And so 
rehoming do we have the funds are we able to provide those homes um, could people rehome more and provide more education on that or do we just leave them and so this is another thing like the experts say if they're on their own they're probably not doing much damage but we just don't know yet so we recommend you don't pick them up the survey is purely observational so if you're taking part just view them uh, report your sightings to the tally if it's caught by accident it is recommended you uh, immediately release it otherwise you're committing an offence and they are your responsibility once you pick them up so you would need to take them to a vet if they're ill or injured or a licensed sanctuary um, we do now have a website uh, as you can see the www.fertiltally.co.uk um, it's got information available and guidance uh, there's the survey we also have an angler survey now as well so we have the general public survey and an angler only survey so that we can capture data in fishing lakes and uh, you can contact us through those means as well and hopefully more updates on research being carried out and that's basically it from me Thank you for that, Susie. It's really interesting. Uh, it's vital that we have this research ongoing, uh, something that's been really lacking. A lot of the questions that are coming through um, really highlight the fact that we just don't know the answers yet. The research hasn't been done. So what you're doing is absolutely vital um, and will really help us to inform um, management in future, uh, should it be deemed necessary. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. OK, um, we have got some time um, for a few questions. Um, it, it's great to be in the company um, of such uh, knowledgeable attendees, actually. Um, lots of the questions that have coming, been coming through have been answered um, by, by um, experts that, that are um, attendees on, on this seminar. So thank you very much for that. It's made my life a lot easier. Um, we'll go through a few of the questions here. And um, we've got some on the chat. Um, there's a few on, um, on the but some on the chat and some on the um, q and I'll try and get to some of each of them. Um, okay, um, this is from Brett Lewis to Rob. Have you captured any of the economic benefits of having wall lizards in the country? Well, hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm not sure what the economic benefits would, would be in this case with this species. Um, it would be easy to see for obviously a species that's been introduced for for food, but generally when we talk about non-natives invasive species, we talk about negative uh, economic impacts where they cause you know damage to infrastructure that then needs to prepare. And I I draw my experience with the non-native iguanas for that in terms of the like I say the infrastructure that I, that they damage then obviously requires you know funds to to repair that. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure that there would be any any economic benefits to uh, to war lizards per se. I don't know if Brett could put something on the chat. The only thing I can think of is um, I, I forced my parents to go to the botanic gardens in the Isle of Wight so we could go and see the war lizards. <laughs> Well, that's yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting point actually, Angie. Because but again, it's a very it's a negative uh, impact. Um, I know in the Isle of Wight, they, in an, in an attempt to uh, mitigate against damage to their their war lizards, they uh, they did some uh, some mediation work to a, a wall to provide access for the the lizards to still you know commute through in and out of this wall, so they they weren't harmed when the works were going on. So there's a, an economic cost there, obviously, but a negative one. So yeah, like I said, I'm not sure what the, the benefits would be exactly. I think Brett's come up with my same thing as me. He says perhaps local towns yeah, okay. visitors and also a local cafe in Kent from those visiting the lizards. So it's the same thing. People flock to known sites. Yeah, yeah, and that's yeah, over the course of the discourse analysis, then yeah, I would say I didn't encounter certainly any any statements that would suggest that that's why people had specifically gone to those sort of areas. So uh, in answer directly to the question, uh, no, I didn't encounter any personally. Thanks for that, Rob. Um, Chris Catherine, uh, one of uh, my fellow ARG UK trustees, has, has pointed out something really valid here. Um, he said that um, native is defined in policy differently in Scotland. It's a very local definition. If a species is lost from a part of its natural range, that area is no longer considered its native range and the species is non-native 
thereafter. So that's a really important distinction. Um, the GB Non-Native Species Secretariat maybe isn't actually valid for the whole of GB. Um, I will point that out to Olaf when I speak to him next. <laughs> Thanks for that, Chris. Um, okay, um, are these two turtles reproducing in the wild? I think you've covered that in your talk, Susie. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Um, yeah, the, I mean, we have to look at um, turtles, um, you know, incubation temperatures and climate um, temperatures. So um, even if we had temperatures that were long enough um, for them to incubate, um, I, I would expect the temperatures maybe not to be hot enough for us to get a mixed sex ratio um, because they are temperature sex temp dependent. So if we're on the lower end of the scale in our sort of lower 20s, then we may be getting more males. And if we're in the upper end, we get more females. Um, but if our temperatures aren't giving us that and it's uh, fluctuating, then, uh, you know, what kind of skewed population or hatchlings are you going to be getting anyway? Um, but the fact is that uh, if we're talking about thriving, um, but yeah, I, I would say at the moment, you know, we just don't know, do we? Um, if we, our temperatures are hot for longer during the summer um, and, you know, we just have to keep an eye out really. Thanks, Susie. Uh, we've got one for, for um, Chris here. Um, great talk, thanks. What would be the capacity for keeping animals at the rescue centre? What happens when capacity is reached since um, you can't rehome the animals? Well, so that is a very good question. Um, our capacity is limited. We currently, so as matters stand, we don't keep the turtles here. Um, the National Turtle Sanctuary was basically spawned from what we were doing here, and that's based in Lincolnshire. Uh, and uh, that's a center that's being developed at the moment. Uh, it's part of a, um, um, a wildlife park. Um, that will have quite extensive capacity when that's completed. We also work with our, our own sanct another sanctuary in Bedfordshire. So we probably have, we have reasonable capacity at the moment. Um, the numbers are growing. We need to create more capacity. Um, it's as simple as that. Ultimately, I guess where this could go is that then euthanasia becomes an option. But the problem I have with that, if that's perceived by the public, then they will release the turtles rather than ha hand them into us. So this is an ongoing challenge for us to actually just be able to develop greater capacity. But we really don't have any understanding at the moment how many of these animals are out there. So it is a problem for us. Thank you, Chris. Um... Uh, Mike has, has uh, made a very valid point about uh, the possibility that we may well have to reevaluate our definitions at some point. This is something that I've had some really interesting discussions with people about. Uh, this is concerning climate change. Um, we, we live on an island, um, so it's particularly difficult for us. But if you have a look at mainland Europe and you look at how species are naturally migrating further, further north, um, that may be something we, we need to consider in future. Obviously, we do have a um, that the, the channel as the barrier, but definitely that's something that we need to think about in terms of preserving some species which might otherwise be lost. So yeah, make a very very valid point there, Mike. Okay, um, let's have a look. So uh, uh, John Cranfield, uh, reporting turtles and other non-natives, would our web and record pool be suitable to getting records to the turtle tally? This is something yes, we spoke so, about the other day, didn't we? Yes. So, yeah, definitely. That's um, something. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the more the more data we can get, the better. So it's, it's all very relevant. So um, we're all working together to try and make that work better and try and get the data. The, the important part is the collaboration, as far as I'm concerned, you know, getting people involved. And that's not just people on you know, out walking their dogs, having a look, that is about all of us getting involved and, you know, sort of putting our resources together and trying to find out what's going on. And, uh, you know, I think it's a learning process for all of us. So we're just going through the motions and trying to work out what we can do and what's going on. So, yeah, definitely. Thanks, Susie. Um, there's one from Lindsay Thomas here. Is there an organisation you would recommend for rehoming amphibians? So we've discussed uh, reptiles um, today. 
Um, either Chris or Angie, have you got a, an answer for that one? So we do amphibians, as, so we do reptiles, amphibians and invertebrates. Okay, great. Thank you. That's a nice, nice, uh, nice answer there. <laughs> Um, okay. Um, Colin Melsom asks, are any of the recorded wall lizard colonies in localities where smooth snakes occur? Have any studies been done into the positive or negative effects on the wall lizards to the smooth snakes? Great question. Yeah, this is something I was very interested in, in terms of positive, potential positive impacts, not necessarily with smooth snakes. I'm personally not aware of any uh, crossover in habitat there. Um, obviously a lot of the wall lizard population is in very urban areas rather than rural. The exception to that is a lot of the, the quarries on the, on the south coast. And then we're potentially talking about a, an impact on adder populations down there. Um, the wall lizards, they, they, they survive and they form populations at much higher density than, than our common wall lizards and, and sand lizards. And purely observational, I noticed a lot of adders in the quarries that had wall lizards compared to those that didn't. And it's an aspect of research that really does need taking up, I, I feel. So yeah, we could be seeing a, a beneficial impact of the wall lizards being here purely by uh, coincidence of the, the high densities that they reach and supplementing and predators. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting avenue of investigation, but specifically smooth snakes. No, I'm, I'm not aware of any habitat crossover actually. Thanks Rob. Uh, Joshua Bryant asks, how long does a non-native species have to live and thrive in the UK before it can be considered as a native or can it never be? Well, as things stand at the moment, um, they, they will never be a native species because they weren't here um, at that point that I mentioned earlier. Um, however, however, we do have some species which are considered naturalised. Um, so, so <laughs> it's a very strange classification actually because it's kind of middle ground. There's one species which uh, is a plant species I've worked with. Um, Claytonia sibirica, the uh, pink purslane, which is considered a naturalized species. It's been here for around 100 years um, and, and, and was integrated within habitats um, and within um, the other species composition. But in recent years, it's become fairly invasive. I've had lots of re uh, reports of it of, of being invasive. So um, whilst we do have these definitions, I think we need to be really adaptable and fluid with those um, classifications um, and learn to adapt with things as the situation changes. But in terms of becoming a native, um, current classifications wouldn't uh, wouldn't wouldn't con consider species to be native if they weren't here before. Um, okay, I've got an interesting one from Nat McCon um, to Rob. Have you come across people wanting to keep the wall lizards to manage spider insect populations in their own households due to fears of these native species? Yeah, great question. Um, Again, this is one I've, I've thought about a lot. It's not something I necessarily encountered here, but certainly in on Vancouver Island, where after you know, 40 years of relatively stable wall lizard populations, there was a, suddenly a huge exponential increase in their spread and abundance across the island. And it, it would appear that it's, a, it's an issue of threshold then. So you've got more people encountering them. And, and I didn't include this in the, uh, the discourse study but the opinions there over there in Vancouver Island would probably be very different to the, those that in the UK where populations are smaller and density is less. But certainly, yeah, the members of the public in on Vancouver Island uh, were noticing a, a positive effect that the wall lizards were having in terms of keeping aphids down. Uh, but again, I think that's an issue of, of threshold. I think we, we have to look at uh, the population reaching a certain density before we, you know, people start thinking about these sort of things. And I don't think we've reached that necessarily in the UK as yet. Thanks, Rob. We've had several questions on um, hybridization um, of newts as well. Um, as far as the alpine newt is concerned, I've had uh, reports coming into me and certainly other people have as well as of hybridizations with another introduced newt species, a marbled newt. So um, that, that's one instance where um, we have had that, that record come in. Um, we'd need another member of the panel, um, a genetics expert to deal with a lot of those, I think, especially considering the number of subspecies um, that we have. Um, okay, I'm conscious of the time. Um, Angie, am I going to be cut off? <laughs> No, you won't be cut off. I mean, everybody might leave, but we can carry on chatting for another five, ten minutes as long as, as long as okay. the <laughs> fine. 
Um, okay, so we've got a, 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 an interesting question from um, Mike Close about um, public perceptions. Um, so he mentioned Gordon the Gecko um, that had hitchhiked um, from Italy to Aberdeen. They, um, they, they called the SSPCA um, and then the animal apparently was euthanized because um, of risk of infection. And, and this is something which um, Chris, you're quite conscious of with that, that um, the, the importance of a positive public perception of rehoming centres, isn't it? Um, to make sure that people are happy with where the animals are going. I think it's absolutely crucial. Um, so just as, I mean, we've got so many fascinating stories of animals and the way they've come in. We have a really good, have a really good one from Scotland, which was about 18 months ago. A grandmother went out to uh, Australia to visit her daughter. While she was staying there, uh, she saw a snake in her room, uh, which scared them all. So that she, they left the house, they called the snake catcher. He came in the following day, they couldn't find the snake. Grandmother stayed there for another three weeks, came back to Edinburgh. She unpacked her suitcase and in the suitcase in her shoe was a snake, which she assumed was a rubber snake that her daughter had put in as a joke. Uh, she picked it up uh, to look at it and it wasn't a rubber snake at all. It was a live snake and it was actually uh, a spotted python. Um, so the SSPCA came out and collected it. Um, they caught it up. They decided it was not something they could keep. It was beyond their bits of specialist for them. So they actually drove it from Edinburgh down to here. And we have him here and he's called Bruce. And the school, so the daughter, the grandmother lives in Edinburgh, the daughter lives in Australia, and the school now follow Bruce's uh, daily exploits uh, via web links. And things like that are quite positive. And so we do quite a few of those. We, we had uh, two skinks that came in. We get a lot of things in at the moment from India coming in in sandstone. And last week, one came in from a very famous person um, in, I won't mention names, a very famous guitar player from a famous group. If you're a certain age, you'll remember. Um, it turned up in his house. Um, they brought that here. Uh, she's called Flojo, um, the, the one we had earlier in the year. I won't say his name because it's not polite, but he's incredibly quick. Uh, and, and so people like them, and, and the thought of them being killed or uh, euthanized is not acceptable. And that, that's what we're trying to do here. So we have quite a collection of animals that come here. Um, uh, and I think people are much more likely to do something as long as if they think there's a positive outcome for that animal than if there's going to be a negative outcome for that animal. So I do think that's really important. Thanks, Chris. Um, we've, we've got uh, a comment from Jason Steele. Um, I'm not going to get into to politics here, um, but his question is why have various government non-native species organizations decided in the past that all non-native species should be treated the same as a high priority for eradication? Um, that's maybe something that we ought to pose to, to them my experience of working with government departments is that um, in, in recent years, they're very much following the precautionary prin principle, and, um, but also having to prioritize what we're doing. Funding for control and eradication is very, very limited. Um, the, the money that um, is available is, is practically non-existent. So um, th those projects have to be chosen very carefully. Um, in terms of allowing a non-native species to colonize when we don't actually know what the risks are, I think that's too high a risk to take myself. Um, if you imagine a non-native species being released and then five years down the line suddenly realizing, oh, this is actually really, really dangerous. It's an invasive species. Uh, and when we could have done something about it initially, um, if it's possible to do that, um, then, then my personal thought is maybe that's something that should be considered at the point of initial incursion, rather than waiting and seeing what happens. I will say though that the work that um, scientists such as Helen Roy are doing uh, in terms of risk assessing these species is, is great. Um, they've worked really hard to produce these risk assessments. So we're much more clued up about what's likely to become invasive in the future. Um, and maybe those, um, those um, documents will really help to influence the management that actually happens um, in GB from now on. But yeah, it's a really interesting point, Jason. Sometimes we do, um, we do battle against um, other opinions um, in order to do what we feel is the right thing. Um, Angie, have you missed any? Have I missed anything that we we might um, 
might be particularly interesting. Um, I think we've covered most. Um, oh, there's one about wall lizards here. Um, it's it is there any idea of um, what the lizards, uh, presumably common population, um, if any, existed in places before any wall lizards appeared? Yeah, good question. Uh, we don't necessarily have that baseline data. And, and again, as I mentioned in the talk, the, the impacts on native lizards is largely uh, anecdotal. And through my field work alone, especially again down in the quarries and uh, in Purbeck there, there is a, a very obvious to me at least uh, difference between uh, the abundance of common lizards in the quarries where wall lizards are present and where wall lizards are absent. So it does seem that the uh, the common lizard is, is pushed out when wall lizard do, does become abundant. Uh, and this was also kind of proven in my uh, behavioral studies in terms of scent recognition that common wall lizards, uh, sorry, common lizards did react to the scent of wall lizards by retreating and not going anywhere near a, a scented swab. And although that obviously isn't a, a de definitive proof of an impact, it does suggest that yeah, common common lizards would be inclined to move away from areas where war lizards are prevalent. But obviously, there's so many factors that would would Im influence that. Particularly, you know, habitat quality, so many different influences. It's very hard to quantify. But from purely anecdotal experience, I would say uh, war lizards are having an effect at least on common lizards. Thanks, Rob. Um, one from Andy Ferguson, who um, who talks about yeah. how much money um, is spent on general public awareness. That's a really interesting one. Uh, the 1.8 million is quoted as being on management and control rather than on um, awareness raising. Um, certainly Kate and I are, are working really hard on, on the public awareness side of things. So we're working with all of the stakeholders at um, South Southwest Water and Southwest Lakes Trust, and indeed with Singh as well, um, that's one of our main focuses is on education and awareness raising uh, and as I alluded to in, in my talk it's, it's one of the most important things that we can do is to, to um, educate people um, so, so that we're all aware of the situation um, and I, I, I completely agree with you that um, Andy that, that more money spent at that stage could really help to prevent incursions in the future. Uh, we have got a couple of others there. Um, how is the MCRW funded and is funding an issue for the long-term care of reptiles? <sighs> funding is always an issue. Um, so it's one of our big challenges. Um, we had initial funding. Um, Pets at Home gave us over £300,000 worth of equipment, which is what we use here to keep the animals with. Um, Support adoption for pets gave us another 98,000 to help build the center. Um, and we have to do our own fundraising to try to keep the whole thing running. Um, we have resources for another year. This year has been an absolute nightmare. A lot of what we would do would be outreach programs, education programs, going into schools, uh, events. Uh, none of that's happened this year. So sadly, um, fundraising is an issue, but I think that's a perennial problem for most charities. But uh, we survive one way or another, we'll get there. But it is an issue. Thank you, Chris. Um, I apologise if I've missed any um, questions. Do get in touch if there's anything else that, that we can help with. I think most of the other things I can see um, on the chat there have, have been covered, really. Um, but yeah, do get in touch if there's anything else. Um, thank you so much to all my fellow, fellow presenters. And uh, yeah, Angie, is there anything else you'd like to say? No, um, as ever, a big thank you. Um, I'm going to try and share my final screen. So, uh, here we go. Uh, so, massive thank you to Nicola for fantastic chairing and to all our speakers. Um, yet again, we've had this sort of incredible conversation where people have expressed um, different views than perhaps you see in the mainstream and we've been able to address uh, issues and tease out some some new sort of thought-provoking concepts so I'm, I'm really happy that again we've all been able to come together and 
just thank you so much to our presenters for, for all their hard work in putting together such great presentations and giving up their time on a Thursday evening. So next two weeks, uh, we have our final end of year ARG Jamboree, which will include something on Ice Age ponds in Herefordshire, something on mitigating cycle paths for reptiles <laughs> or moving cycle paths for reptiles in Cornwall. And we're going to have a conversation about adders and um, how to find adders in places you wouldn't normally expect them to be, I think is the way we're going to put that. So greatly looking forward to that. Massive thanks to all our speakers tonight and for everybody that hung on for another 10 minutes just to uh, hear all the questions. And we'll see you all in two weeks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks.